You're back with the dulcet tones of Breaking Down Security. I'm Brian Brake, and uh, back with us this week is, of course, Miss Berlin. Yay! And Mr. Betcher. Hello. And Ms. Berlin, of course, has been out for the last couple of weeks. The first week she was ill, feeling sickly. Uh, the the pre the, the the week after that she was um, I don't know. She gave me some lame excuse about being in Germany. So <laughs> it made it really hard to podcast. How did Germany go? Really well. Yeah. Yeah, really well. And which, um, I'd never been there before, really? and I I had a lot of fun. The the conference I went to wasn't an information security conference, which was different. Wait. wait. Um. What was it then? Yeah. So when Derby tweeted out that I was having the mental health village there, this guy contacted me and it's called Dosh Fest. Dosh Fest. Um, so for the three countries that are involved in their Google developers group. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, D for Dashland, Germany, right? Yeah. Uh, A for Austria. Um, Austria and CH for Switzerland. Oh, okay. Um. And it was interesting. It was the first time they had done it and the venue wasn't the greatest, but um, it was, it was nice. It was way low, way lower key than the one I did at Derby. There weren't any talks or anything. It was just kind of a lounge. Oh, okay. Um, but he, one of the organizers contacted me after Derby tweeted out about theirs and he wanted to see if I wanted to go over there. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So they, they, uh, did you talk at all or was it just the village? Nope. Just the village. Oh, that's weird. So did were, did you have a lot of people in the uh, space? No. <laughs> oh. I don't know. I want to say maybe three dozen um, total over two days. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> but it, oh. I mean, it was a small conference. They they had maybe 300 people. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so percentage wise, I think it was about the same. Right. And considering my lounge was on the other side of the college building that we were in. Okay. It made it hard to find. So, oh. well, you know, logistical issues aside, it sounds like uh, you had fun, though. Did you go I and did. do any sightseeing? I didn't at all, really. Oh. I mean, other than dinner to a couple nice places, but yeah. So you met really some new time. people. I was only there for three days. Oh wow! So you went, did the conference, and then flew home immediately. Yes, pretty much. Wow! So you didn't even have time to have like proper jet lag. Oh, I had jet lag the whole time I was there. I just never recovered from it. <laughs> oh, my hell. Wow. Okay. Well, Mr. Betcher, how you been this week? Not too bad. Yeah. I was, yep, uh, very, I was very happy about Miss, uh, Miss Coldwater, uh, Ian Coldwater's talk about Kubernetes. Um, it's Nettie's, Nettie Pod, Nettie. I'm so sad that I missed it. That's okay. You can listen to next week, part two. No, but like oh. being on it, I wanted, like, I've also InfoSec Sherpa, like I I was supposed to be on podcast with her now for the last like three years and we never, it never works out. Like it just, it's terrible luck. Well, maybe, maybe, you know, you two have never been in the same room together. Maybe you're like Superman and Clark Kent or something. Uh-huh. You never know. <laughs> Or, you know, Supergirl and Cara Donvers. Anyway. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're going to bring our guest on because uh, we're going to we're going to need the time because uh, uh, we got a lot to talk about. Uh, so if you want to listen to like naive Brian talk about some of this topic, you can go back clear to 2016 um, around episode 20 ish or so. And we had this guy on with me and Mr. Betcher. This was in the before times of uh, uh, BC before, no, was it BC? It was it BB before Berlin? Yeah, there you go. Um, so, so the podcast that don't really matter. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> wow yeah yeah it was it was before crap. you got before we got famous yeah it was crap before we brought you know mando on yeah yeah, yeah. yeah before before it got real yeah before, yeah yeah before the exp- the explicit we tag was a regular yeah yeah before the, the explicit, explicit tags. tags yeah um so we're having jared freitas back on and at the time we had jared on he was like a year into his brand new job at, at in guardians i think a year year and a half and we started talking about like what to expect when you're expecting a a, a pen test in this case uh, not a baby of course but a pen test and uh, in the last, what, two years, you've had a couple additions to the family. You're still working at Guardians, And um, we have constantly been trying to get you back on the show to, you know, continue talking about this, this 
this issue. And I've changed jobs. Mr. Betcher's changed jobs. Miss Berlin's, you know, came on the show. And... <laughs> And change jobs. <laughs> and change jobs. So, you know, wanted to, you know, maybe get uh, a take from somebody who's now working at a pen test company myself, but also get Mr. Betcher and Ms. Berlin's uh, point of view on this. So uh, welcome, Jared, back to the show. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good overnight. Wherever you are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, let's get things out of the way. Uh, you're at Jared Freitas on uh, on Twitter, because when we first had you on the show, I couldn't pronounce your name. I got better. Um, at J-A-R-R-O-D-F-R-A-T-E-S, Jared Freitas. Yes, because I had no creativity when I was creating my Twitter handle. That's okay. Have you heard and mine? Today, today's actually, uh, I got a, an alert from Twitter. Today's my eight-year anniversary on Twitter. Nice. nice. Very nice. Okay. So before we get to the actual discussion about the pen test, there was some very interesting uh, Twitter story that came out uh, today, as a matter of fact, from Tinkersec, uh, at Tinkersec on Twitter. Uh, he did an engagement, and he was like, L look, children, gather around the fire, and Uncle Tinkersec will tell you a story. And... Um, you you read through it and there's a there's a link in the show notes but he uh was kicked off a network he was on an engagement he got kicked off the network uh they found him and they hunted him down and <laughs> that's what it says and physically hunted me down so um it was very uh mission impossible esque he could take it yeah it was right so he started on the inside so he actually was brought in as a new employee uh the CISO was the only person with the get out of jail free card uh, was given a work computer, an ID, a badge. So basically, he was doing the the tool or the the role of an insider threat. So he was a malicious new employee, and he was trying to wreak all kinds of hell uh, in the marketing department. He was quote unquote Jeremy for marketing. So um, they really went through a lot to get him like onboarded. I mean, he had a week only to be on site, but I mean, they brought him in, made introductions. He was, you know, he actually got onboarded and everything, which I found interesting. Yeah, I usually that's not how the social engineering <clears throat> is done, um, because there is an aspect of social engineering to that, even though, you know, he he was sort of walked in and, and provided a, a bunch of the tools, but he still had to convince the people around him that he was cool. Yeah. Um, or at least not a threat. And, uh, you know, ultimately, well, I'm not going to give away the story, but uh, the it didn't quite go as planned on that aspect. Um <laughs> But uh, those those kind of engagements, I have not been on myself, uh, but they are really interesting to hear about those who have. Um, and the kind of things that you can do are – so on a lot of our internal tests, um, we, get asked, we get access to some workstation. Usually it's a new build that's done for us. We get generic credentials, and it's like, okay, go and see what you can do. And – there's a lot of opportunity there, but not the same opportunities as what Tinker was talking about. Right. Um, being able to look around and physical access and uh, just you know, overhearing things, right. stuff like that. So that, it's, it's a really cool thing. And the story, it, he's just a fantastic storyteller. It, it was definitely a funny story, uh, or actually it was an interesting story that a lot of people who've done a lot of engagements are going to be like, yep, I've had that, that issue, or yes, that, that happened to me. So... Um, there were some things that he did, you know, we're not going to give all of the secrets away, but there were, there was a couple of things that he, he came up against that actually kind of stymied him. Um, you know, uh, the, you know, the ability for the local admins to be restricted. He was like, nobody does that. You know, who, who, who actually restricts local admins on, in, in your environment. So, um, he was stymied by, by what I would consider to be rather simple things like that. Um, do you have and in, go ahead. I was going to say, and the, and the company that hired him for that specific type of role, you know, where the CISO is the only one that knows, and they're actually going through the process of figuring out, like, the correct way to test, like, insider threat. Right. Um, I, I just think a company that has gone through all of that probably is already going to have pretty fantastic defensive inside measures. Yeah. Yeah. You know, where a lot of a lot of places I don't think do. That's why they make you start from the outside because they're hoping their perimeter defenses are, are better than their internal. Yeah. And there's, there's a philosophy that I've, I've heard at other companies. It's like, well, you know, we should trust who's working with us. Cause if we can't trust them, then we can't, you know, well, there's trust. And then there's not giving them the keys to the kingdom on 
just because you're too lazy to configure. Yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> Amanda, you, you've got a great point. Jared, do you find that to be the case where companies that are really, really insecure are like, okay, hack us. Just, we're not going to tell you anything. We're not even going to give you any IPs, right? All the way down to, hey, here's a, here's a machine. You're on the network. You pop the box, see what you can do. Yeah, we've we run into the uh, the range of that. So we do have we do get some some uh, borderline crystal box testing for internal of you know here's our pass here's our password policy and you know here's some credentials and you know see what you can do and then we go and we look and we find out that you know twenty five or thirty percent of their users are domain admins. Oh God, it's not going to go verify. Hey, the record. Um, and I think it was Larry Pesci, one of my colleagues that ran into it. The record was on like, I think it was 300 and something users in the domain and like 250 of them were domain admins. Oh my God. And <laughs> yeah, it makes it easy because they can get to all the stuff they need. Yeah. Um, but, um, but then we get all the way down to, um, you know, uh, here's a web app and, you know, we've, we think we've got it locked down. And we want you to test the whole thing all the way through, but we're not going to give you credentials because you're hackers, so you should be able to get them. Right, right. You, you know, at my job, we're 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 quick to tell them, hey, you know, um, you're spending a fair decent amount of money. I, I won't lie; we're not exactly what you would consider cheap here in the industry. But um, if you want us to spend a week trying to just get credentials to log into your system to test the application, then you know you're wasting we consider it a waste of your money and we don't want to be that way. So, you know, we try to suggest to the customer that, you know, some credentials is good. And usually the, 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 the customers we work with don't ever ask us, you know, just to do a complete black box uh, test. We don't, uh, we tend to shy away from those as much as possible. Yeah. There are cases where we can go through and find out, um, you know, it, we, we have clients that use fairly predictable schemes. They'll use like two letters and four numbers. Right. And if we can figure out an idea of what some common first two letters are, well, the number piece is easy. Cause you know, then we've got what 10,000 max for each, yeah. each, each letter pair. Yeah. We can do password spray and see stuff like that. But yep. if you're rolling out your application for the first time and you have like five users total in the entire database, expecting us to figure out how to get in isn't really worth it. And if you think we're going to get in anyway, you're probably not ready for a test. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they don't, they don't, they think, you know, Oh, you should be able to get in cause you know, you're Uber lead hackers, but most attackers have way more time than, than, you know, simple pen test would have to be able to get into things. And, you know, they bide their time, they look around, you know, they figure those things out when you're, when you're working a one to two week or, you know, three week gig, you don't really, you know, have that kind of time. So. Yeah. If you want to pay us to test your app for a year, we can do that. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. All the gold. We're not going to turn, turn that opportunity down, but <laughs> yep. There are probably uh, there are probably better places for you to spend that kind of money. Yep. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put this kind of to a round table because Amanda's she she works for an MSSP, so I'm certain that she's got some you know customers that are engaging in pen testing. And Mr. Betcher, he works for a company that you know will ask for pen tests. So um, I'll go to Miss Berlin first. Uh, do you ever have your customers tell you that they're going to have pen tests? And, you know, what to, you know, do they ever let you know ahead of time or is there any kind of, uh, you know, warning when that happens? Um, The only time it usually happens is if it's like a redo. So they've already had a pen test and we've not alerted on the things that they need to alert on because say they're not sending us the right logs or um, there's some blind spot somewhere. Right. Um, So usually they'll tell us then. Um, but initially they're not supposed to, right. I mean, otherwise we're not doing our jobs to detect the right stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, so do they come to you after the engagement and say, Hey, you know, we had a pen test. What did you guys see? Or why didn't yep. you tell us you were at, you know, this happened during the pen test? Yep. Yeah. We'll get that oh. a lot after afterwards. And because we also like, I don't think it's really a, like, a in their contract or anything, but we always offer the service of, um, you know, walking through the pen test report, you know, line by line to see, all right, well, if you wanted to detect on this attack, you would have had to send us logs from these devices with this level and, and we would need to create alerts around that. Right. Um, 
but it's it's a it's a very back and forth process, which is nice when they when they do share uh, the pen test results because then you get a better end result after you do do pay for it because they're already paying us monthly, right, as an MSSP. So they should at least get that uh, bang for their buck. Sure. <clears throat> um, so, Mr. Betcher, uh, you guys employ companies that come in and do pen tests, right? So, right. I mean, what what are some of the things that you, you ask them to do? Uh, is it depending on scope or is it depending on what, what scenario you guys would like to play out on this? It all depends on what the management team feels is necessary to do at the time. Usually it's unfortunately to check a box. Right. So uh, my prior company, which was was smaller, uh, the security team would know about it and we would try to take a a tact like, okay, let's just do things normally. We know it's going on and uh, see if our alerts are working. Right. Right. And then we'll tell the pen tester, okay, we saw this alert and we investigate it. looks like um, you guys, is it? Things like that. Or if, if they do happen to um, pop a box that we know about, then we can kick them off and then go to them and say, was this you? Uh, and usually they'll say, yeah, 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 that was us. In a bigger company like the one I'm at now, typically it's, well, there's two scenarios. If the hackers don't succeed. It's like, yeah, you guys, uh, we had a pen test and you know, they, they didn't really get much or if they did get something valuable, they'll say, okay, here's patient zero. Now go figure out what happened. Right. Right. And so we, we come in after the fact sort of like, um, I don't know, sort of like we've detected it now. Mm Mm-hmm. And then go in and, and get forensics involved and see what you can get out of the logs and see if we can determine how far they went, things like that. So there's a lot of options there um, in, in the latter case and the former case. Cool. Yeah, we've, we've had customers come, like if, if we've alerted on something that the pen tester was doing, um, they'll usually tell us then. Right. Like, yes, this is, you know, we're having an active pen test. You caught that. And then we'll just save the rest of the alerts um, that we can correlate with that till afterwards. So they're not also being inundated. <laughs> right. Right. So, um, yep. <clears throat> so Jared, you, uh, you mentioned here on some of your takeaways and that was some of these things are bulletized uh, because uh, Mr. Tinker uh, uh, had added those at the, the end of his story about, you know, lessons learned or whatever. Um, are these uh, takeaways that you tell the blue team before or after you go through the engagement? Like, you know, are you ready for a pen test? Do you have these things? Otherwise, you probably shouldn't have our pen test. We we try to have a little bit of a relationship with our clients. And the, the type of relationship that we have depends on the client. We have some that we do a lot of work with that they have uh, broken up their testing into a bunch of smaller ones. Um, they'll have usually one or two large ones through the year um, that we have to get into um, sampling where, you know, we touch 5% of the uh, workstations and 25% of the servers or something like that. And, uh, but we, we have others that, um, that are just sort of, they, they come to us, they want their test and they want the report and then we don't hear from them again until next year. And then they come to us and they say, hey, can you do another test? And we go in and we, sometimes we find out we're doing the same test as we did the year before because right. they haven't fixed uh, most of their stuff. Um, the better the relationship that you have with your with your testers, um, and this matters whether you keep the same tester or you rotate testers, um, the better the relationship you have with them, the better the understanding they have of your business the better results you're going to get from the test. And the same thing applies to the MSSPs. Um, we've, we've told like, we have people that come to us and they say, you know, especially like career security people. And they say, Hey, our company has an MSSP. And uh, you know, what do you think about MSSPs? And there's this sort of like, you know, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, please tell us that they suck. <laughs> and um, we, we, we tell them all the same thing. We, we tell them, look, MSSPs are not, they're not personnel replacements. They are force multipliers. 
if you don't work with them, they don't know what to look for. Right. Yep. And the better they understand your business, the better they're going to be at catching things. And that is whether it's somebody coming in from China or Romania or whatever, or a pen tester. Right. And the, and if they know where to look, they're going to be able to put things together much more easily to try and figure out where things or to see where the gaps are. They'll, they'll also understand in many cases where it is, uh, like Amanda mentioned, um, they'll point out where your logs are short, uh, where some st- stuff's either not getting delivered or not enough detail um, or, or something where the logic train doesn't match up. And um, so, yeah, build your relationships with all of your security vendors. Cool. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so it makes my life so much easier. <laughs> well, aren't, aren't you like, you know, they don't really want to talk to you until something bad happens kind of thing. Is that, is that how you see a lot yeah, of the- And they just think sometimes it's just this magic service. Right. Um, no matter where I've been, they just think it's a magic service that you can turn on and boom, they're just getting alerts now. Yeah. And it's, I can tell you the people that, are nice to work with that are also super attentive and just add us as part of their team have way better security. Yeah. Well, cause they get it. It's a son. It's a maturity thing, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's not, I, I have, I, I have customers right now of both kinds. Um, some of them get irritated when we send any alerts at all. Others are working with us daily to make everything better. Right. So, do they get irritated because you send them false positives, but that's because no. they don't send you? Th- okay. The one, the one I'm currently thinking of is uh, irritated at us because we're sending him too many actual <laughs> alerts and there none of them are false positives. Mm. That's not good. That's <laughs> He's not just good. too busy to deal with it. So, yeah. So Jared, do you think that in your line of work, uh, companies don't want to necessarily reach out and have a working relationship with y'all because they're just, you're just there to tell them what's wrong? Not what's right. I would say, so for in guardians, I think the fraction of those that are willing to pursue a relationship is higher. Um, That may be because honestly, we're a bit on the more expensive side. Um, You get what you pay for. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, even, even at the previous, uh, even at my previous employer, I, I would say probably a good, between 40 and 50% were really interested in what was going on. And um, I think we're probably adding guardians. We're, we're a bit higher than that. Uh, We're not, uh, we're not a hundred percent. We do get people who come in and they just, they want to check a box and go away. Um, And okay, that's, that's fine. We're still going to give you the best test that we can. um, And hopefully you'll, you'll heed our recommendations, but um but as I was saying before, the, if you if you come in expecting to build a uh, a relationship with us, you're going to have a better time overall. Cool. All right. So let's say people are wanting to build that relationship. What are some of the things that they should do before you're actually doing the test? I know we've got some some points in here. Um, you know, talking it over with the stakeholders. Um, so who would be the stakeholders in this case? Would it, it doesn't this depend on the scope of the, of the, the engagement? I mean, if you're going to be testing all the things, technically that would be every department in the organization versus, you know, Oh, we've got a brand new web app that we're doing. So the, the stakeholders would, would, would flex a bit, right? Yes. So the stakeholders at the most basic level, the stakeholders are whoever's running the company. Um, It's their job to make sure that money is still coming in. And by the way, that applies no matter whether you're for profit or nonprofit, you you church or whatever. Um, If you have this infrastructure that somebody could get into, you need to make sure that's secure because otherwise if you're, if the money that's coming in goes elsewhere, whether it's sales diverted or uh, credit cards stolen or whatever, you're going to have less coming in. Um, The, at a at a somewhat deeper level, it's whoever owns the particular systems, and mm. that can be uh, at a department level or it can be at an IT level. Um, and sometimes it's all of the above. You you have uh, we have we have um, one client in particular that 
literally the board of directors gets involved. They get the pen, they get a copy of the pen test report. Wow. And they go through it. And that goes down to the executives of the company. And that goes down to it and auditing. And that goes down to those that are actually working on the servers. And even those that are working on the help desk. Mm. And, um, they are, they are extremely responsive. Um, they, they went from, so we came in first time about two years ago and um, they said, you know, Hey, look, we know you're going to get into things. We're not done with our, we're not done with, with restructuring our IT or our, our security architecture. And we got way further, way faster than they thought. Like I, I want to say it took us four hours to get domain admin. Wow. So like we show up on Monday and we got domain admin that we went to launch. And the, the second time that we came in, uh, earlier this year, it took us two days and it was literally like nine 30 at night that we got domain admin. And, um, you know, and they were kind of like, Oh, well, you know, you still got it. We said, no, 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 no. From a time perspective, you guys did like four or five times better than you did last time. Right. Not to mention that we had to get your head of it involved to tell you guys to stop blocking us. <laughs> right. So, um, and it, it you know, that's, that's one of those cases where the relationship really works, but they also had enough people involved um, in the entire, the entire thing, knowing, well, they didn't know at first that there was a pen test going on. They figured it out about a day and a half into it. Um, but, uh, but they involve all of the levels once the report actually comes in. And actually in this particular case, this last test, they involved all the levels during, and in both cases, they flew us out for a one day uh, debrief. That was an entire day. Sometimes we go out and we do a debrief and it's like two hours in front of the board of directors or the executives. And, you know, we tell them at a business level, here's what happened. And what these guys do is they bring us out for a full day to essentially uh, train all of their levels in what we did. Mm. Okay. And, that kind of ownership of the process or not, not of the process, but of the results is fairly rare, but we have watched them go from really, um, you know, maybe you should cons- reconsider the number of systems that are facing the internet uh, to you guys are about average and that in two years. Yeah. Why well, would and- the board of directors be that involved in a pen test and I'm not being facetious about it. I'm just saying, wow, you just never hear that. You, you really don't. We, when we learned about that, it really surprised us. Um, Cause we find a lot of cases where the executives get involved to one degree or another. Um, usually like a CIO, uh, maybe the, the chief operating officer, um, chief financial officer, since they're involved in risk and sometimes the CEO. The board of directors in this case was involved um, because they figured out fairly early on, uh, I guess we weren't part of this because the whole process got started about four or five years ago. Um, But they figured out from what they were hearing on early tests fairly early on that things were not just bad, but they were like catastrophically bad. And they knew that unless they got behind things, stuff wasn't going to get done. And um, they are in they are in a PII sensitive industry, and they knew that if something happened, it would become a major national story, and due to certain circumstances, possibly an international story. That makes sense. Yeah, I'm so when you had them come out. And when they had you come out and they were doing the debrief and it was a day long thing, uh, you basically had to tell everybody the same thing, but with a different point of view or with a different uh, bent to it. So the, the, the board wants to know overarching kind of stuff, uh, you know, down to the rank and file, the help desk folks about, you know, like fairly, well, I would say fairly technical, um, depending on how technical the help desk is. Um, so you would tell like how many different groups, the same story every time, but just in a different way. <laughs> we, we have yet to actually talk to the board. Um, the, but we have talked to the executives and they have been, uh, they have asked some very pointed questions sometimes and um, they are very deeply involved in it. And um, 
then we we go over the results it, because each time it's been multiple tests. We do some external, some wireless, some web, an internal test, and then we present all of that. And so it's basically going through, okay, here's what we found. And inevitably, a few times during it, we get somebody who says, oh, wait, 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 that's not supposed to be that way. Where did you find that? And we say, okay, well, we found, you know, we found WEP in this location. We found, um, you know, we, we were able to do password sprays in this other location. And and uh, and they take notes and they ask questions and they look for clarifications. Okay, what tool did you use? Where can I get that? That's all in the report. Um, and not that I'm trying to short them. It's just that sometimes I don't have the URL right off the top of my head. Yeah, go to github.com slash Uber hacker slash. So, um but, you know, we pointed to it. We say, look, read the report. There's lots of examples in there. This is the tool that we used. I try to get a couple of demos in for key things. Um, but that's one of the things that I love about them is that from help desk to general IT to um, the their telecommunications group, because I sat down and I, I talked uh, VoIP security with one of the guys and uh, up into their security group into their auditing group, they're all invested in it and they all want to make it better. And it makes me feel really good when I come away from one of those and, you know, it's like, wow, they, these guys care and they want to make it better. Right. Right. So, so let's say there's a, you've got an org new company. Um, is management buy-in a requirement for, uh, for, for pen tests? I mean, I'm asking kind of a rhetorical question because obviously management has to have, buy off on a, on a, a monetary uh, venture such as this, but for, for real and change legal. and legal. Yeah. Uh, for, but for like real change or to, to change the, the culture so that, you know, the next time you come in, you don't see those. Um, do you have to get management to, to care about the vulnerabilities when you're, when you're doing the brief? It helps a lot to get the, to make sure that you get the resources that you need to implement it. Right. Um, the, the first major pen test that I was ever involved in was many, many years ago. Um, and the report that we got handed was basically a 500 page report, which looking back on it now, I realize it wasn't, it was an okay report, but it wasn't a great report. There's a lot of Nessa stuff in it. Um, but it was a 500 page report and the CIO ordered everybody to delete it. I've had that happen before. Yes. And okay, great. How are we supposed to fix what's wrong? Right. right. So um, from, I mean, that was, that wasn't a matter of management, not buying in. That was a matter of management burying things. That's yeah. the exact worst thing that can happen. Yeah. Um, but if management buys in, then you can get the time. You can potentially get the money. Um, you can maybe get an advisor or two to come in and help. You can uh, maybe get policy changes put in place that would otherwise be difficult or impossible to do. Right. <clears throat> cool. All right. So uh, I'm going to go back to Miss Berlin because I have a question about the the deering because we we've kind of talked a little bit about before and a little bit about after, but deering. Um, have you ever worked with customers that are doing pen tests and you know about it and you work with the pen testers to, you know, Oh yeah, we saw that. Here's, here's what we saw. Or, you know, as a way of detect, you know, knowing if the detection mechanisms are working. Only internally. Only internally. Um, yeah. So like if we pen test our own company, Right. Um, or if it's an, if it's a retest, those are the only two times I've ever, and, and I thought it would be weird working for an MSSP that handles both. Um, is it, and they do a very good job of separating it and not, and like there's different management and there's different, um, communication platforms. And it's basically like two companies inside of one because mm. we only work with them when it's, uh, initiated by the customer right okay okay um yeah, that that independence is is really key um there were there were certainly issues with my previous employer <clears throat> um but one of the things that we did not have an issue with was independence and i alluded to this a little bit uh two years ago but there was a case where um somebody didn't like the report that we gave and they wanted the original word copy and we said no you get a pdf copy they said well pdf is hard to copy and paste from <laughs> okay, that's sort of the point. 
but you know, we were nice enough about it. We, we said, this is the policy. We do this to, um, you know, to limit the ability to, um, uh, edit to prison to yeah we didn't say edit but we we basically said you know we we do this to maximize the the, the possible uh, maximize the chance that everybody gets the same report and they said well you know we're going to take it to we're going to take it to your management and i basically said okay and as soon as i sent that off i got on the phone to my boss and i said you know hey this is what they're going to be calling you about this this is what you need to do well they didn't call my boss they called the vice president Oh, my boss, however, did call the vice president before they called him and explained the situation. And he told them, no, you don't get a copy of the word, because if you do, then we don't have control over the report. Right. And um, we had a few of those cases. We had a I, I talked to I don't know how many QSAs who would their first question was, you know, you work for the same company that's providing these other services. You know, how much independence do you have? And I would explain, we have complete editorial independence. We do not have the same reporting arc and, and all this. And um, so you do want to be careful about a company that does both and the reporting arc is the same uh, because in some cases, people will try to use pen tests as sales tools and that's entirely the wrong way to do it. Yeah. Yep. Um, but if you can find a company that has proper separation and can do the two of them, um, it's it's at least worth looking at. Right. And I say that because you should be interviewing any company that you work with, whether uh, whether it's Miss Berlin's company or in Guardians or anybody else. You should be talking to them and understanding, get an understanding of of how they work. Um, see, get an idea of what sort of product they produce. The you know, get a sample of the report. Um, you're going to sign. You're going to sign uh, non-disclosure agreements. Um, ideally, in order to do this, please sign non-disclosure. Please sign mutual <laughs> NDAs. Right. So um, the, but you know, don't be afraid to go out there and talk to two or three or six or twelve different companies until you find one that you're comfortable with. Right. Um, <clears throat> so we, we were talking about stuff, you know, all over the place we're before, during and after. But so you mentioned here on in the before part, the report is the product gets samples. Well, you want samples of the report? Yes. Uh, so the, the company should have a generalized sample of what the report looks like. So you can see what the flow is. You can see how they write up the findings. Um, you can see the kind of information they're going to present to you. Right. So, um, in Guardians presents in one particular way. Uh, Miss Berlin's company may present in another way. Uh, you want to find something that's going to work for you, and it might be that you know three or four different companies provide a work product that ultimately works for you, that provides the information you need, and then so you start looking at other factors. Yeah. But um, what you don't want is a report that says this is broke. You should fix it. Right. If if the problem and the solution are one sentence each for every single finding, that's a bad sign. If there's a price tag to fix it, that's an even worse sign. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah. No, that uh, – okay. I never thought of actually giving them a sample report or at least giving them an idea of the format of the report. That's a, that's an interesting uh, interesting thought. Um, <clears throat> so, well, as, uh, you, as a pen tester, you should have those samples prepared – and as a client trying to hire a pen tester, you should definitely ask for samples. Yes. Yeah. I've, I've had um, um, some management hire pen testers, and they absolutely hated the report hmm. afterwards. They didn't it, think it was professional, yada, yada, yada. Wow. They never used them again. But they should have asked for a sample to begin with, and they probably could have made that determination before even hiring them. Well, yeah. What was it they didn't like? Was it the writing style, or was it just the the format was just real clunky? I mean, because that well, I I can't really get into it, but um, yeah, they just thought that it was not something that they would like to bring to their management, like the CEO. Okay. And and the rest of the um, C suite. Yeah. Well, so it, we've yeah. had, I'll give you an example of a case where we had somebody who didn't like 
some information that came in a report was uh, we had this just super gigantic web application. And so we had to, we didn't have any choice. We had to do an automated scan for part of it. We did a lot of manual testing, but we had to do an automated scan for part of it. And so we provided them a list of like six or 700 URLs that appeared to have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. And we said, you know, look, these, these are not validated. Uh, these came from an automated tool, but you should look into them. And, uh, and we pointed out, we said, there's probably some common code pieces that you can, that you can find that'll match these up. And they came back and they said, well, we don't want anything in the report that's not been fully validated. Wow. And we want you to go back and validate all of these. Mm-hmm. Okay. You're going to need to write another check. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they, they just, if it wasn't validated, they didn't want it in the report. And ultimately they kind of backed down because we pointed out to them that this is still useful information for them, but they were still not terribly happy about it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, wow. That's, that's quite interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, my company, I work, I work for a company that is uh, not a direct competitor to, to Guardians, but Leviathan, we have a, you know, we try to, to do different parts in our report. We try to do an executive summary, which is kind of generic. Like we, you know, we assume a management person might see this and, um, you know, we're not getting overly technical. So we have like an executive summary and our, our methodology on how overall methodology with how we do testing, which it does change depending on the type of engagement. Uh, because, you know, we, we try to, we know, and we're not stupid that you know management will want to see what they've paid for because you know if they paid eighty thousand dollars then um they're going to get an eighty thousand dollar report but you know hopefully they come out all the more secure for that uh we we burbers yes i i love that cartoon (laughs) yes uh jared typed something in next to my uh, my initials so um but yeah, we, we, we try to, you know, have a, an overarching or a more generic version of the report. And then we have, uh, various components or something that we break down and then we get technical on that side because we expect the people who are actually going to take our findings for action to, you know, know, you know, steps to reproduce, you know, the issue, uh, you know, if there was a retest, did the retest actually find that these had been affected, so, I mean, you know, it, it does, you know, I, I agree. There definitely should be samples, but, you know, um, you, your company should be writing a good report to begin with. I mean, if, if the company that did the, you know, is asking for the pen test doesn't accept the report as written, there's, you know, maybe, maybe they need to go back to the, the drawing board. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, we, we can, we can update to a degree, but we're not going to completely restructure the report right. just on your request, right. at least n- if you tell us ahead of time you need it in a particular format, then we might, but yeah. there might be some extra time involved in that. Would you reformat it if, let's say, they needed uh, like certain uh, like compliance frameworks require you to test, you know, outside versus in, you know, inside versus inside, inside to DMZ, external to DMZ, that kind of stuff? Would you would you format it <laughs> yeah. according to that? Yeah, there's some minor changes that we can do, and we already do some of that. So we have uh, every once in a while we'll somebody we'll have somebody who says, "Hey, can you do a, a web app test and an external and put it in the same report?" Mm. That's an easy enough split to do. Sure. But if you're going to ask us to do a complete change up, you know, like everything after the executive summary needs to be restructured and reformatted according to this, that's going to take time. Right. I mean, it 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 takes us time to build out the basic report structure as it is. And we're, we do revise it periodically. Um, but that takes time. Yep. And if you're going to ask us to revise it again, just for you, then there may be some additional time involved in that. We'll still listen. We will, we'll do what we can within the existing structure. But if, if you need something that looks extremely different, it's expect a little bit of extra time for that. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Betcher, do you uh, do you see the pen test reports that come back for your organization, or is it just depending on the uh, the the scope of the engagement for that pen test? It depends on the scope. Sometimes I do, sometimes not. If it directly relates to my team, yes, they'll hand me the report and say, "Hey, uh, how can we improve in these areas?" Mm-hmm. Things like that. Yeah. Um, so it so it all depends. So. I had a, there was something earlier, I've got a note here that says scenario. Um, 
I think you uh, said that, Mr. Butcher. You said, like, the pen test depends on the, the scope or the scenario. And you said management sets the scenario. How do they how do they decide that? Do you know that? Or is it, uh, hey, we just recently did an IR tabletop and we've noticed these things. Uh, we're going to employ, you know, we're going to talk to, you know, a pen test company and have them to do a pen test based on the findings or the results of this scenario? Is it, is it something like that? Or is it like, Oh, they're just throwing a dartboard. We saw this in CIO magazine and that's what we're going to do. No, I think the management team, at least in the larger companies probably knows where they're weaker. And Mm -hmm. so they'll direct the pen testers to that area. Ah, okay. Rather than just say, Oh, just, get in and see what you can find. Right. That sort of thing. Because they, they probably know that as all companies do, we, we have a lot of work to do and we have to cover the 80, 20 rule. Right. But we need to test that 80%. Yeah. Right. Don't go after the, the, the new hotness that might be, might take a genius to hack, go after the 80% that we should have down pat. Right. And see if we have any major flaws in that. Right. If you have SQL injection, don't worry about Spectre. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't isn't that like one of those next yep. level things? It's like, don't worry about Spectre because, you know, there's about 8,000 other things that are probably more important for you to fix before you have to deal with something that is a hardware based vulnerability that you can't necessarily fix anyway. Yes, absolutely. Ding. It, it, that, that kind of that kind of prioritization is I think it's getting better but it still has a lot of work to, to a long way to go in general. Right. Right. Um, so communication during before and after, uh, so before, um, how, how important is it for, uh, customers to ask the right questions and what are some of the questions that a client should ask you before the, the test actually gets started? They should be asking you what sort of background you have from a defensive perspective. Um, if you have a team, if you're if you're talking to a team that has done nothing in their entire careers but offensive act- uh, activities, there's a fair chance that they're not going to understand what the practical implications of their suggestions are. Mm, I can see um, that. You should also be asking questions about um, kind of how they. This is getting back to the last thing, but, you know, how do you structure a report? How do you write the report? Um, You know, feel free to ask, are you writing it as you go? Are you writing it afterward? Um, You know, what what sort of evidence is going to be coming in? Um, Ask them about any custom tools that they use. You know, have you written anything or, you know, have you adopted things? And if you see a cool tool that's mentioned on Twitter, what do you do with it? If they say, well, I grab it and I throw it at your environment, that's probably not a good sign. Um, Unless they read it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hopefully, yeah. Hopefully they understand it if they wrote it. Although looking back at some of my own code, I, I'm I'm glad that I put comments in, which That's a good I point. guess marks me as not a developer because I actually comment my code. <laughs> um, but um, also ask them how are they going to get the information to you? Hmm. Um, if they're if if it's just going to come to you in a um, if the only possible way that they have to send it to you is in a password encrypted zip and they're going to email you the password, that's maybe a bit of a red flag. Um, man, I got stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have stories too. I have, I have many oh, stories on that one too. God. Um, you know, but you know, if they, if they say, Hey, we've got, you know, three different ways we can send it to you. We can send it to you. Um, like, you know, for us, we have a, we have an encrypted file share. We can send it to you, uh, GPG encrypted. Um, we can send you a zip and then we send you an out of band, uh, password that we usually send through signal or something like that when we can. Um, we've actually had, I, in the last year, I think I've had three or four clients that have signed up for signal just for this purpose. Oh, cool. Um, and then the nice thing is, is we can also then shoot the messages and say, you know, hey, we found on this server at this IP address, we found this flaw because mm. uh, we can send it over Signal, right? And we can have this, you know, running conversation, and it's it's helpful. Um, but uh, it's something that you can sort of have over Apple iMessage, over straight text message, not really, right? And over open email, it's just completely out. Mm. 
Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, um, one of one of the other things that we do a lot at uh, Leviathan is we do uh, weekly status, and any of the new findings we put in a status report and and give to the customer because we don't want any surprises. You know, if we give them the final report and it's got fifty findings and there's fifteen you know critical bugs and twelve high bugs and you know eighteen medium bugs and whatever, uh, they're gonna get overwhelmed. So every week we mm-hmm. try to tell them, okay. You know, this is what we've done for testing this week. We tested X, Y, and Z. We did code review on this mobile, you know, app, that kind of stuff. Here's the bugs that we found. And we we tend to have at least a one hour a week meeting with the tester, myself as as PM, and um, the, the, the point of contact for the customer. And we, we discuss the bugs that were found and why we triaged them the way we did. And that gives them a chance to look at the bug and, and get their internal processes started for plan of action and milestones or, oh, my God, we need to fix this now. We can't wait until the end of the engagement, that kind of stuff. Um, we, we find that, um, you know, it, it puts a little, a little more at ease in, in this case. Yeah, um, the, the during communication varies by client. We have clients that want to have a 30 minute phone call every day. Oh, which, really? Okay, we can do that. God. But just keep in mind that that means you're taking away two and a half hours of testing time through the through the course of the week. Yeah, um, we have okay. others who say, "Hey, can you just send us a quick summary email each day? It takes five minutes to type up. We send right. it off." It, you know, it's something like, um, you know, we found a, we found a cross site script that doesn't seem to really go anywhere, but we're still following it up. Yeah. Uh, you know, or you know, we found so far that all we found is that you you need better crypto. Um, or sometimes we send something off and saying, Hey, so your email server, your internal exchange server is named this, right? We should probably have a quick talk. And, you know, 10 minutes later, we're on the phone with them explaining how it is that we got in and asking him. So do you want us to, to dump all your hashes off the domain? Cause we can do that now. Yeah. Um, but it's dependent, you know, every, every client is a little bit different. Some of them, it's just like, you know what, if you don't find anything critical, don't say anything to us. We'll talk to you at the end of the week. Mm. And, you know, and others are, are looking for more complete write-ups each week. And frankly, sometimes the half hour phone call is better than the half an hour of writing up things. Right. Um, Cause we can get to the point, we can answer the questions. And so, yeah, no, that makes sense. The, um, uh, yeah, it, just, it it seems like it depends. Like we've had customers just like, yeah, have the meeting with us. And then others, it's like, oh, yeah, we're going to let you in on our internal Slack with a channel. And we're going to, you know, be able to hash things out at the same time. With, that way we get like a, a white box kind of thing. I, you know, I hesitate to tell them that, you know, it's not exactly like secure end to end. Um, you don't own the Slack servers. I you know, that's, that's on them though. I mean, if they're using it for business case, then, you know, there, there are a lot of companies that still use that for that. So, um, I don't know. Is there any, is, um, is there anything else we'd like to discuss? I know we're getting here to the top of the hour and this didn't exactly, uh, go along before, during, and after we just kind of bounced all over the place, but, um, (laughs) Ms. Berlin, what is what is what is pen testing look like uh, from a from a, a, bl- a defender point of view? I mean, um, do you guys see an uptick in activity when things like this happen usually, or is it uh, is it fairly ideally. silent? <laughs> it depends on the testers. Yeah, depends on the testers how noisy they are, and it also depends on how well the MSSP has been managed and uh, implemented uh, because you can, like I said, like not work with your MSSP at all. And you're going to send what, like firewall IPS logs, Mm -hmm. which aren't hard to get by. So, you know, we might not see uh, pen testers at all and it's super quiet. And then they wonder why. Um, Or there's other times where, uh, you know, the pen testers, even, even if it is, you know, zero logging almost, we'll still see them because they uh, really don't know how to be quiet. What's the, what's the alert like for that? Do you, do you actually let your customer know, Hey, we're noticing some weird stuff going on. Um, yep. Are you required to, uh, I know we have this problem with some, with some AWS stuff, but we had to do like a pen test permission slip for a lot of, a lot of organizations have to do that. Uh, do you ever have to whitelist IPs to get around like WAFs or something because, you know, it's just too difficult or do you guys even deal with the WAFs at, at organizations um, or 
cloud flares or anything like that? I, uh, when I worked at the hospital, um, we did not know there was a pen test going on and had to unblock it after we had blocked it in the middle of one. Well, that um, good for you. You figured it out. Yeah, it was, it was like one of the later years when we went through all the very, very painful ah, okay. <laughs> security fixes. Uh, um, I completely lost my train of thought. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to hijack something there. Um, yeah, go ahead. It has to do with hospitals. Um, and th- there's also a little bit of a segue here that gets to um, some of the preparatory stuff. If you have never had a pen test before, consider getting an architecture review instead of a pen test. Oh, yes. Because um, <laughs> so not a hospital, but a pharmaceutical company um, that uh, contacted us and this, they said, you know, hey, um, we would like to get a pen test. And uh, our our sales department, uh, our, our lead salesperson, Jamie, uh, was talking to them and she kind of realized that they were really maybe in over their heads and said, you know, maybe an architecture review would be better for you guys. And um, so a couple of us went out there and we were there for, for three days and like walking in the door, the number of things that they didn't know meant that we would have had domain admin in like an hour. And that's a waste of money. It, it is, yeah. It's a huge waste of money. But the architecture review, however, we started asking questions and they started asking questions. And so we got this great conversation going back and forth and we still haven't done the pen test for them yet, but that's because they're still rebuilding a bunch of stuff, uh, getting ready for the pen test yeah. later. Um, but one of the things that we started asking questions about was the threat models. And we said, okay, so, you know, what, what are your threat models? Okay. And okay, are you worried about, you know, a giant multinational pharmaceutical coming in and stealing your stuff? And they said, well, no, because if they were really interested in this drug, they could probably do in a year what it's taken us five years to do because they have vastly more resources. And so, okay. Understandable. Um, do you work with contractors? Yes. Well, where are your contractors? Well, they're in, you know, this country and that country and this other country. And we said, okay, so what kind of vetting do you do? Do do you issue them hardware? No, they bring their own hardware. Okay. We need to build out a a whole threat model for you before you start getting into a pen. Aside from all the architecture stuff, we need to build a threat model for you uh, with your assistance. We've asked a bunch of questions about it. And that is going to change how you do the pen test. And the same thing with the hospital. When, when we've talked to hospitals in the past, you know, they're concerned about, they're concerned about things like um, uh, insurance fraud, you know, people getting a hold of stuff in one state and uh, insurance information in one state and using it in another state, which is uh, apparently a very, very common thing. Um, they're concerned about PII leaking. They're concerned about medical records leaking. And then I said, what happens if a celebrity shows up? in one of your hospitals. And I usually get silence. And I said, you, you need to understand you have an insider threat, which they understand pretty well, actually, because they know that their nurses and doctors and, or whatever are going to go looking at, at the, the records and they, they can handle that. Their health record, their EHR systems usually will flag that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, we say, are you prepared for somebody for a politician coming in? that suddenly might get interest from uh, from international espionage agencies to go looking at things. And even though I, t- even though I tell everybody, look, if Mossad is your fear, if the CIA or the NSA or the FSB or the GRU is your fear go home, you're done. Um, right. But you, you, you still, it, in reality, you still need to be prepared to watch for these kind of things. You know, if, you know, if a senator suddenly shows up in one of your hospitals, there's going to be attention on your hospital, whether it's from international agencies or just people who are trying to get a hold of information. And in a lot of cases, it's a threat model they haven't considered. Right. Right. <clears throat> so when you do an architectural review, um, are you you're basically helping them create the network diagrams they should already have? It's um, yes. In a lot of cases, there's network diagrams, there's asset 
management. Uh, we'll we'll actually use a few of our our regular scanning tools. We'll use Nmap to kind of see what their network looks like. We'll use right. Bloodhound to see what their domain look looks like. Um, sometimes we'll run Nessus. Um, we don't run Nessus on a regular basis, but we keep a license around just because every once in a while somebody comes in and says, "Hey, we've got a hundred thousand IP addresses. Please scan them." Right. You have a week. Yeah. Okay. Um, but in these cases, you know, it's like, this is why you should figure out a vulnerability scanner of your own to get and why you should run it. And, you know, we look at basic configurations and we look at, uh, we also look at, at their personnel architecture. Um, you know, how many people do you have? How many IT people do you have for how many users you have? Uh, you have four people for a group, of, you know, for a hundred employees. Okay. That's actually an okay ratio. You have four people for a thousand employees. Mm, you need to automate a lot of things. Right. So, um, but once that happens, then when they, if they can get a handle on things, they come back for a pen test. One, their architecture is in better shape. And two, they've started learning to ask questions. Right. And figure out where things need to go. Right. Okay. Very cool. All right. Well, we're after the top of the hour, and I know we could probably go another whole hour on this because uh, <laughs> we've all got stories about poor, bad pen tests that we've been given or like. So I, I, I do want to touch on one thing real quick before okay. we wrap things up. All right. And that is after you've gotten the report and we've delivered you a 70 page report filled with all kinds of things. Don't. Blame people unnecessarily. Sometimes blame has to go, but you have to be careful about how you do that. I'm going to give you two stories on blame. And one is um, one is a case sort of of self-blame. So we went into an environment and uh, we were supposed to target a particular set of servers. And the lead admin for it was watching. And like every time we did something, his heart sank. And he would come over every once in a while and say, hey, I watched you doing this. And like as the day went by, he just got more and more pale. Mm. And we're just like, okay, look, we're not trying to make you look bad. We're actually trying to help you on all this stuff. you know. And so we, we talked to him and we went through things and, and he seemed to feel better by the end of the day. But it was still – it was like you know he was watching his architecture that he was in charge of fall. Right. And – we said, look, the goal here is that when we come back in a year, a year and a half or two years or whatever, that it's going to be more difficult. And you've already spotted half a dozen things that need to get fixed before we've even put it in a report. Before we talk to you, you've already spotted some of these things. Yeah, most people don't spot them at all. Exactly. <laughs> yep. like, like he was sitting there like obsessively watching what we were doing. Right. And um, we said, you are doing exactly the right thing. And I know it's rough. I, you know, I've, I've been on the defensive side and, you know, been there while a pen tester skittered his way through, through our network. The other side of things was uh, we had a couple of people on site. I wasn't directly involved in this one, but we had a couple of people on site. They were doing an internal test and the testing ran a little bit late and everybody went, everybody around them went home. So while they were waiting for some stuff to finish up, they decided to take a little walk around. Oh no. And they found some passwords on post-its and, you know, things like that. And so they mentioned this in the, they mentioned this in the report and they were doing a debriefing at the end of the week before they went home. And they said, you know, this is what we found. And one of the higher management people said, I want names. Mm. And they went, that's not really the point. Right. You know, there, there's a general practice here that I want names. And we generally are all about providing you the information that you need to fix things. But if you're looking for scalps, technically you can get it. You're going to find a little bit of resistance because that's, you shouldn't be scalp hunting right after the report has been delivered. Yes. It's a practice that needs to get fixed, but if you're looking to fire people over, over some of the stuff, you're not going to be doing yourself any favors. Well, I, I would posit that by maybe the people that he's expecting you found this stuff on, not you, the Royal, you, mm -hmm. um, maybe that like, uh, you know, like that GSA employee that got fired recently for, you know, 
you know, surfing the porn all over the place. He'd yep. gone to the training. He'd been informed. He knows what was acceptable and what wasn't. Uh, maybe he'd been counseled before and you ended up finding it again on the same place to the same person. So he's been told he's been warned. The guy you were telling that to has probably seen it before. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, but yeah. it, it could be that, you know, it's a hygiene thing. And, you know, next time he was caught, it has to be reported to HR, you know, there, there's additional stuff. So, um, you know, there, there could have been, there could have been a, a good reason for it other than just hunting scalps. There, there <laughs> could, but in this particular case, it was, it was kind of on the widespread side. Uh, and uh, so it seemed to be much more of a systemic problem. If we'd seen it like one or two sp- cases, you know, maybe it would have been, you know, hey, can you go talk to, you know, Jane Doe and John Smith and let them know that they shouldn't do this. Right. Um, but it was a it was a larger scale systemic thing. And that is what made us a little bit skittish. And it, uh, also the demeanor oh, that the, was involved. The way it was delivered, the message, give me, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, when you get, I want names. Bring me the head of, yeah. Whoa, hold on. Time. You know, if it was just like, you know, hey, can you give us some examples of, of who was involved? Right. You know, okay, well, you know, here's a couple of managers. And by the way, we were in your office too. Oh. I don't know if they were in that particular case, but I have gotten into, uh, on the, the, the couple of occasions that I've done physical stuff, I've gotten into executives' offices and found interesting things. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if, we can tell pretty quickly when, when somebody's trying to get names for retaliatory purposes, yeah. you know, we're, we're not trying to make anybody look bad. Um, you know, least of all the, the people on the ground. And because it, look, if you, if you walked into my office and I'm sure if you looked around enough, you're going to find something that I shouldn't be doing. Right. Um, but some of the people weren't full fledged security people. They were, you know, they were like, you know, IT secretaries and stuff like that. Right. <clears throat> and so, you know, be careful. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, like I said, we could talk for hours about this stuff. The, uh, the story about hiding the pen test thing. Yeah. I, 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 it's, I got a story. Please don't hide your pen tests. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> don't, you, don't you can limit them. distribution. You can limit distribution. That's cool. Right. Don't just say delete it. Don't memory hole it. Yeah. It it needs to be, it needs to, that baby needs to come out into the, to the light and, and, you know, be ugly. So, yep. um, so Jared, uh, I know we mentioned your Twitter, uh, ahead of time, but if people wanted to talk to you about how the pen testing process works, uh, you know, uh, how would they go about getting a hold of you? Uh, you can hit me on Twitter. You can, uh, you can send me an, an Email to my private address, uh, which is jfreitas at gmail.com. You can drop me a note at work, which is uh, jfreitas at ingardians.com. By the way, I do want to mention one other real quick thing uh, that's sort of tangentially related to this, uh, which is two of my colleagues, Larry Pesci and Suzanne Pereira, are uh, director of research and director of uh, operations, respectively, uh, recently did a talk uh, also called What to Expect When You're Expecting a Pen Test Oh, really? uh, at Worldwide Hacking Fest. The video is up on YouTube. They talk about some different things than we've talked about tonight. Theirs is a little bit more focused, a little more narrowly on the, the operational aspects of setting things up. Uh, so there's a touch of overlap, but uh, theirs is coming from a little different direction. Well, damn it. I thought I was being like, you know, clever and stuff with the <laughs> what to expect when you're expecting. <laughs> damn it. All right. Well, I can't use that as the title of the next podcast then. Uh, all right. That's um, okay. Yeah. So, all right. So, um, Miss Berlin, uh, will, will you have, so you did the, the mental health village in Germany and at DerbyCon, and you're going to do it at a couple of other places, which we'll talk about in a second, yes. but you have a, a new company. I do. I'm so excited. She's a legitimate uh, business so person. We <laughs> we just became a nonprofit in Ohio. Uh, so it's called Mental Health Hackers. And we are going for our 501c3, um, which I guess is very difficult because I'm now on page 10 of the narrative of why the government shouldn't charge me taxes. What? Um you have to like do this giant explanation and cite sources and uh, it's, it's a pretty in-depth process it seems. Um, But yeah, uh, Megan Roddy is our uh, wonderful CFO. No kidding. 
Yeah, she's our CFO and she's kicking butt. Uh, we, we're doing, we're setting up Amazon and PayPal and banking accounts and checking accounts and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's good to be in the know, Brian. Yeah, yeah. I know. Megan's also one of our moderators on our Slack channel. Uh, she does she a is. kick-ass job. So Yeah, so we, uh, we have six board members now. Um, and I think as soon as we get our banking account up, we can start taking official donations. Apparently my, um, my invitation to the board was lost in the mail, but, uh, I, I will accept, <laughs> I will accept in abstentia the, uh, the, the board, uh, nomination. Oh, we have work for you to do. You don't need to be on the board to oh. do work. <laughs> oh, great. So I'm, I'm a flying monkey. Is that what you're trying to say? So I'm, I'm doing a keynote, uh, in two weeks at secure WV and it's like the second. I'm doing the second half of my, or part two of my mental health talk. Um, and I, I'm going to talk about the board and um, the company and things that I've learned over the last year or so. And then we now have 13 different conferences interested in us coming. Good Lord. <laughs> That's Which I'm lot. glad there's more board, board members because there's no way I can go to all of these. Right. <clears throat> That's cool. Yeah, you're delegating authority and stuff. So yep. that's cool. Yep. Um, I have I have a COO that uh it's, it's his only job is to keep me alive. Um Oh wow. Yep. Keep you in in wine and uh, chocolate? Yes. Very cool. Yes. <laughs> Very cool. Okay. Um so uh eventually people will be able to donate money to you for non-profit charity type tax purposes. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Cool. All and right. I believe we can do it now, technically, but I don't have a bank account, so I'd rather people waited. <laughs> yeah, when I set up when I set up my infosec company for you know donations because of training and stuff, it was like a catch twenty two. You couldn't take money and be a business until you had a bank account, but to be a bank account, you had to have a business, and it, it was just kind of weird. So, um, I, thankfully, I figured out how to do it. So it was in the state of cool. Washington. Money they're not. Shuffling. Yeah, in the state of Washington, they're not very friendly to small businesses. It's more like biz, big business friendly. So, um, um, <clears throat> Ohio seems to be pretty good. Um, yeah. It took two days for our business to be approved wow. after I sent in the form. Very nice. Uh, I hear federal takes way longer than that. Mm -hmm. um, over, yep. I mean, we're technically a nonprofit in the state of Ohio, and then federally we will be um, one hopefully soon. You should look into being veteran owned. You are a veteran, aren't you? I am not. Oh, Oh, that's right. You went to boot camp. I'm sorry. Susan, I, uh, Susan is a veteran that she's she's on our board. Oh, well, um, <laughs> you may want to look in to see if that's if that's something you guys can do and get additional tax tax breaks. Ooh. Yeah, hmm. um, I'm going to I'm going to definitely petition for that uh, if in the state of Washington here when that happens. So a um, couple of other announcements, CFPs for B-Side Seattle, which I will be attending. Uh, deadline for that is actually on the 26th of November, 2018. Uh, there's a link in the show notes if you want to get in on B-Side Seattle 2019. It's going to be at Microsoft Commons, uh, the big, big fancy building there where all the, the people from the Microsoftians go to lunch. Uh, Ms. Berlin says B-Side's Nashville is going on and it closes 31 December. So, um, you know, if you're looking to talk at a place, I mean, uh, B-Side Seattle, Seattle, we got like, I want to say 350 people last year. It was probably going to be bigger this year. Uh, besides yeah, be, Nashville's besides fairly large Nash too. Is, it's one of my favorite conferences. There you go. There you go. Um, and yeah, besides Seattle is, I think the 8th and 9th of February. Don't quote me on that. Um, uh, you can go look it up. The link's in the show notes and uh, you can go and find out when that is. Same thing for besides Nash, um, which is in Nashville, uh, in, in the state of Tennessee in the United States. <laughs> planet earth um so Thank um you for being so specific well, I, I try i do what i can um so uh one other thing one other announcement i'm uh, wanting to teach another sec 504 class for sans a mentor class so i need nice. some students so um if you're in the seattle area and you have to be in the seattle area unfortunately um please reach they out to me play in. sorry they can fly in each week. Yeah, I, I actually had some folks in Vancouver saying, oh, yeah, we'll just bring the train down and, and do the do the class on a weekly basis. I was like, wow, if you guys really want to be hardcore like that, yeah, bring take the sprinter down and, uh, you know, 
uh, do that. Uh, I, you know, I can teach in either Seattle or Bellevue. We have discounts if you can actually host, or if you've got three people you want to sign up, we can actually get you a discount for that too. Um, but hit me up on bds.podcast at gmail.com. And, uh, you know, if you're interested, cause uh, I needed three people and then I can reach out to the SANS folks and say, Hey, I've got enough people for a class and then they'll schedule it. So I'm looking for uh, some time at the end of February through March to, to start that. So, um, okay. Announcements are over. Mr. Betcher, if people wanted to get a hold of you to talk about LogMD, how would they go about doing so? They can get me at log-md.com. Okay. For my email, uh, stuff like that. And I'm on Twitter at Betcher Pwned. Um, I've got no new companies or keynotes or whatever, but <laughs> I'm just trying to fight hackers every day, just like Jared. Very cool. Are, <laughs> are you on, on the board of Miss Berlin's menthol hack ha, health hackers or whatever? Mental health hackers. I was not, not in the know in that. Okay. Sorry, guys. Wow. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm sure we were number seven and eight. We well, were I'm like probably, the alternates. You have enough to do. That's oh, yeah. true. That is true. Well, I, I'm, I'm probably first alternate in case somebody can't you know, fulfill the duties on the board, then I can take over. So you, totally. If you, if you would like to, or we also have like this battle to the death written in the clauses. Dun, 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 but, yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Like it's really just with those giant Q-tip things. They're, but, tur- they're turples. Thank you very much. Oh, whatever. <laughs> Star Trek fan here. Thank you very much. Anyway. <laughs> um, cool. So Miss Berlin, you, I, I caught the 1984 reference earlier. I wonder if, anyone else caught that yeah that was the memory hole thing yeah um that's and, when i was born yep and wow oh god you're so young um <laughs> <laughs> all right so you're not gonna be speaking anywhere mr betcher uh for the rest of the year nope. sadly that's all right it's okay i put in to speak at schmoocon i really i i've been shut down every other time so oh. We'll see how this one goes. They'll get you. They'll get you. Um, so if people did want to reach out and ask about the mental health hackers or anything else, Miss Berlin, how'd they get a hold of you? Wait, did you just skip over Brian? Or did I miss that part? No, we just did it right now. You were too busy okay, catching Pokemon you, like, over the there whole, or something. All right, I just wasn't paying attention. It's all right. Yeah. Fast forwarded like 30 seconds or whatever. That's okay. Yeah. I just like, I blacked out for a little bit. It's normal. It's fine. Yeah. I can't, uh, can't talk. I'm catching Pikachu right now. So. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so you can find me at InfoSister, I-N-F-O-S-Y-S-T-I-R, or my new company's Twitter is Hackers Health. My new company. Anyway, <laughs> um, I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. That's fine. It's fine. No, no, no. It's cool. Are you just going to focus on this instead of not being, you know, the author of my forward? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's going to happen eventually, too, I hope. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway. All right. Yeah. So um, we have a lot going on on the podcast as well. We don't need to be on a board. So <laughs> we have a Slack, which has a lot of people on it, including Miss Berlin and Mr. Betcher. And Jared is actually a user of the Slack. He does not use it a lot because, you know, he's busy doing stuff. So um, if you're interested in joining the Slack, you can send a DM to at BreakSec on Twitter, or you can email bds.podcast at gmail.com and we'll get you right on there. Uh, we do have a social well, contract. Or sometimes when we forget and then we'll get you at the second message. <laughs> oh, yes, I know. I'm so I'm awful with that. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, we uh, you know, we we it is invite only. But, you know, as long as you're as long as you're something more than a bot and actually reply to Twitter DMs or, you know, emails, then, you know, we'll, we'll get you in. So uh, we have a, uh, our thank you to all of our uh, patrons, uh, our Patreon. Uh, you know, everyone gives a little money every month because they find value value and everything that was discussed. So if you find value in what you've heard today or with the upcoming uh, episode of part two with the Ian Coldwater about Kubernetes security, Kubernetes security, um, you know, hit us up on, on our Patreon. We have a, uh, a link in the show notes to that. And, um, you know, if you, uh, we're, we're listener supported, we don't have sponsors. It may be something we'll do in the future, but right now, uh, we are, you know, we, we live and die by the people who help us out. So it's, it's, it's good. Uh, all that money goes to hosting and paying for the Zoom, which we're using right now. And, uh, you know, just uh, upkeep and maintenance and po- uh, publishing the show. So that, that's all it does. Uh, so tell your friends if you, uh, you know, also if you found value and you just can't give any money, we're on iTunes, Apple podcast. If you leave feedback, that's great. Cause other people can find us more easily. Uh, Google play store. We're on the iHeartRadio radio app, tune in radio app, Spotify, Spotify's big one. Um, uh, you know, 
most podcatchers have us on there as well. So if uh, you you're looking for us, uh, there's no, there's no place you can't find us. So we even have an RSS feed, and BreakingSecurity.com is our official website. Uh, we have a T Pub store if you want a you know T-shirt or something, and that also gives us a little money as well. Miss Berlin set that up for us, which is awesome. And uh, yeah, you can get a a, a weird picture uh, picture of her on a t shirt, or you can get like one of our new uh, new logos on our t shirts. So or the one that looks normal, or the one that looks normal. Right, right. Um, so that was it, um, Jared. Uh, you know, we'll definitely have you back in the future. I'd like to discuss Bloodhound with somebody who's knowledgeable on how that works. Uh, if you aren't, then maybe you can find somebody who can. Um, but you know. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, I have a couple of colleagues who know it a bit better than I do. Okay. So, and then of course, you know, there's the actual authors for Bloodhound. Right. They, they appear to know something about it. Oh yeah, that's true. That's true. We could probably see about maybe getting them on as well. If, if, but you know, uh, Jared's, uh, you know, longtime uh, friend of us, uh, uh, you know, even before we did the podcast and, uh, you know, we appreciate all his hard work. So, uh, he's, uh, you're always welcome to come back on anytime you want. You know, he's been a guest host every once in a while, too. So, um, one of these days I'm going to come back on. I'm just going to stare at you. Oh, well, you're doing that right now, as a matter of fact. So, <laughs> anyway, all right. Well, that was it for Breaking Down Security this week. Um, be careful, be nice to one another, take care of yourself because you're the only you you have. And we will talk to you again real soon. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.